Welcome to the Church of Christ at Dartmouth College, a member of the United Church of Christ, who believes that whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. In these days when here is virtual, we are so grateful that you have continued to worship with us to support our ministry, giving positive feedback and emails and texts and on Facebook, as well as supporting financially the work of our church. These beautiful long summer days are such a balm to our souls, and we are grateful to share them with you, even if we're not together in the presence of one another. We are together in the spirit of God. And so bless you. May you be filled and nurtured by worship, and may you be revived and renewed to live your life with fullness and grace. <laughs> friends. It's good to communicate with you again. Uh, so many weeks have gone by since uh, that second week in March that I am beginning to lose count. And some of the words I share with you may seem repetitive, though today I hope that they're commonplace. Using the recommended precautions, now more than ever, as the state continues it's gradual opening up of services and businesses. Do protect yourself in the best way that you know. Uh, we are hoping that given our response and the response of the state, I feel that as a state, New Hampshire has been very responsible in how we've responded to the guidelines. Continue to apply them. That is what has been yielding the good results that we have seen. The state's hospitalization rate now slowing down, the frequency of infections also slowing down. So do take care. Remember that I'm always available on the phone or on email. I also offer meditation by Zoom um, every Thursday at 4 p.m. And we, you are always welcome. I look forward to hearing from you or seeing you and when you continue to enjoy good health. We are excited this week to be offering to this congregation and to churches around the state the opportunity to listen to a powerful lecture and webinar by the Reverend Jim Antall, the United Church of Christ Climate Minister. This will be a Zoom webinar on Wednesday, the 22nd of July at seven o'clock, and we will be publishing the Zoom link in a special email and providing it on request to anyone who seeks it. We hope you can join us for an informative and up-to-date message on the power of churches to have an impact on climate change. Speaking of climate change, this week's Green Tea message is brought to us by John Torrey, a member in discernment of the United Church of Christ at Dartmouth College. Hi, my name is John Torrey, and I'm a member of the CCDC Green Team. I'm going to share how I came to care about global warming. I developed geopolitical awareness while spending two college summers living in Tanzania, East Africa. 
While over there, I made friends with local people and read books about global injustice. I soon came to see just how desperate and financially insecure many of my friends were. I had a powerful lesson in economic devastation when my friend Agnes lost her job and faced desperate choices. Tanzania's high unemployment and lack of social safety net doomed many to horrific insecurity. I also learned from teaching impoverished, hungry children at a center for orphans, many of whose parents had died of AIDS. I helped a friend with his rent when he would otherwise have been kicked out of his housing. I conducted research interviews with HIV-positive women. I vicariously experienced global poverty through these friends and contacts. And the books I read showed me the vast global injustices that contributed to their plight. No global injustice is more devastating than climate change. I came to see how vulnerable the Tanzanian economy was and the insecurity and de desperation of my friends who depended on that economy. Climate events such as drought or flooding do and, and could in the future plunge millions of Tanzanians into other destitution. I saw that impoverished people around the world are devastated by and often die from emissions that enrich the globally wealthy. This is utterly obscene. It is horrific what we human beings are doing to each other. It simply has to stop. So I'm angry. I'm angry that powerful, special interests in the rich world are dooming people like my friend Agnes to desperate insecurity. I'm angry that the policies of my beloved United States are ravaging the lives of the Tanzanians I met. I'm angry that African lives and those of people in impoverished countries around the globe seem to be mostly invisible in climate politics. Since my time in Tanzania, I have striven to learn more about climate change's effects on humanity, especially the poor. In Divinity School, I co-led the Andover Newton campus green team. The speakers, movies, and events we brought to campus were illuminating for me and others. This year, I have been blessed to participate in the CCDC green team. It is great to have venues through which I can live my values and do my part, however small, to fight climate destitution around the world. It is because of my Tanzanian friends and billions like them that I care deeply about climate change. I hope you will join me in this fight. Now let us join together in our responsive call to worship. We come before you, Creator God, hungry for relationship. We come to you wanting to discover your essence more completely, even as we learn more about ourselves through you. Your word is full of people seeking you. In gratitude and desperation, we reach out to you and you accept our friendship in the worst days and the best of times. We come to you wanting to discover your essence more completely, even as we learn more about ourselves through you. In the book of Genesis, Hagar is the first and only person in all of scripture to name you she calls you El Roy, the God who sees me. Thank you, God, for seeing us, for walking with us, for sharing yourself with us, and for making us whole. Accept our worship, our praise, and our honor as we gather in your glory. And now, let us join together in our unison prayer of the day. Merciful God, your, Your word is, is a, a guide, guide and a directive. A in, in scripture, we find all manner of people who seek and serve and even, unfortunately, betray you. Help, Help us to live our lives in close companionship with your spirit so that we might be guided, that our days might bring you glory and joy as we live into our calling to be made fully in your image, healing your creation, and loving our neighbors and ourselves. Amen.
are invited day in and day out not to wallow in unworthiness, but to proclaim our worth as we turn to God, honestly reviewing our behavior and ready to be offered forgiveness and healing so that we might live more faithfully and freely in God's never-ending love. Let us pray. Gracious God, God we, are we are so, so easily affected by the world around us, us never more, more so than by our friends. Thank you for giving us good people who can help us to become more loving, kind, patient, courageous, life-affirming. But sometimes we choose to be with people who do not bring out the best in us. And sometimes we are not the kind of people who bring out the best in others. Help us to do better. Empower us to know how to bless and not curse, to encourage and not undermine, to embolden and not belittle. We praise you, God, for being a good friend to us, always ready to support, uphold, inspire us as you enlarge our understanding of your vast, complicated, and wonderful world. Scripture tells us God did not send the divine child into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. We have been given this gift of renewal and forgiveness and hope so that we can participate in the healing of the world and of ourselves. Thanks be to God. In Jesus Christ, we find new life and grace abundant. Amen and amen. This week, I would like to talk with you about people in our lives who mean so much to us. Friends. We have friends from our neighborhood. We have friends from school. We have friends from church. And life is so much better when we have friends. We talk with them. We play with them. We share secrets with them. And they're there for us sometimes when things are bad. But sometimes friends, like relatives, can cause us difficulty. Sometimes friends, even though they love us, can tease us, can say things behind our backs, can lead us in the wrong directions. And we have to be aware that friends can be both a blessing and a challenge. In today's story, from the Bible that Mandy talks about in the book of Job, a man named Job had several friends who were trying their best to help him when things were bad for him. But it didn't go the way they thought it ought to or that Job thought they ought to. And it helps us remember that friendships can have powerful good things about them, but can also be a challenge. Let us hope that we can always be the sort of friends that are helpful and unselfish and generous and kind to each other. Please pray with me now. Loving God, we're grateful for our friends and we're grateful for our chance 
to be a friend to others. Help us be the kind of friend that is valued, a friend who listens, a friend who cares, a friend who was always there in good times and bad. In the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Listen for the word of God that can be found within these words from the book of Job, chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all these troubles that had come upon him, each of them set out from his home. Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the the Namathite. They met together to go and console and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him, and they raised their voices and wept aloud. They tore their robes and threw dust in the air upon their heads. They sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. May God bless our hearing and our understanding of these words. Hear the words of our tradition found in Psalm 55, verses 12 to 14, and verses 20 and 21. Listen for their power and truth. It is not enemies who taunt me. I could bear that. It is not adversaries who deal insolent with me. I could hide from them. But it is you, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend, with whom I kept pleasant company. We walked in the house of God with the throng. My companion laid hands on a friend and violated a covenant with me, with speech smoother than butter, but with a heart set on war, with words that were softer than oil, but in fact were drawn swords. Hear these words spoken by Jesus, the Son of God, found in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 13. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. May God bless our hearing and our understanding. Last week, we began our new sermon series on the book of Job. We looked at who Job is and observed that this scriptural text is a morality tale created to address the issue of human suffering. It comes from a subset of scriptures called the wisdom literature, which in addition to the book of Job, includes the books of Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. Threaded throughout these writings is the difficult question about why an all-loving, all-good, all-powerful God allows human suffering to occur. In reality, ultimately, there is no satisfactory answer 
to this logical problem of human suffering, given who we understand God to be. But the amount of biblical and extra-biblical literature in the Judeo-Christian tradition, as well as many other ancient and modern texts, show us that humanity seems not to be willing to give up on the quest to reconcile God's goodness in the face of human pain. We keep trying to figure this problem out, hoping that if we keep mulling it, talking about it, and wondering about it, we might see our way through to a satisfactory answer. We may not be able to solve the problem of evil in the world, but given that we are all in relationship with others, and that every single one of us experiences pain in our lives, sometimes profound tragedies, and sometimes lighter but annoying difficulties, we would do well to consider how to accompany others and how we'd like to be kept company when we are suffering, even if we can't come to a successful intellectual understanding of why this happens in God's good world. In the very early part of the book of Job, he loses everything that he values, livestock, servants, all of his sons and daughters, and still Job praises God. Next, in the unfolding parable, Job is struck by a terrible skin ailment, one that covers him with loathsome sores from the bottom, the soles of his feet, to the crown of his head. And he sits scratching himself with a broken piece of pottery in an ash heap. It can't get more dismal than this which is in part how wisdom literature works. The scenes are painted so extremely, so dire, that we can't miss the point that the person in pain is devastated. Today's text sees three of Job's friend come right after these initial horrible experiences to support him in his agony. And they begin in the best of all possible ways, silently. Today's text, we see three of Job's friends, and we're told that they sit with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one speaks a word to him, for they see that his suffering is very great. Unfortunately, their wisdom, their gentleness doesn't continue. Job, mindful of their presence perhaps, or maybe just because he has a need to rail out, begins to speak. And although he does not curse God, he does curse the day that he himself was born. He does so in fluid and evocative poetry, reminding us that his parents may have loved one another, but that their coupling was ill-gotten. He points out that kings and princes may have accomplished much, but that they one day will die and will find rest, and that that is all that Job wants as well, to be at rest, to be at ease. And he believes that the only way that he can experience this is through death. He ends his rant saying that he is undone because the thing that I feared has come upon me and what I dreaded befalls me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. The friends have done a good job supporting Job while he remained silent. They were either dumbstruck by his grief or wise enough to not try to make it better. For as long as Job himself didn't talk, neither did they. But as soon as Job put his pain into words and cried out that all life seemed fruitless and hopeless, as soon as he offered up the pain he was in verbally, they felt the need to correct and corral and control him. I had expected to deal with all of the conversations of Job's friends today in this one sermon, but there is too much to cover, and so our series will extend a few extra weeks. Today, we'll look at the speech of the first friend, Elphaz, the Tamanite, who we're told answers Job. So we ought to be tipped off that things aren't going to go well by the very fact that he answers Job's 
railing rather than supports or comfort or simply allows Job to share what he needs to share. He begins by reminding Job that he himself has served as a counselor and a comforter to others. Behold, you have instructed many, Job, and you have strengthened the weak hands. Your words have upheld him who was stumbling. You have made firm the knees of the feeble. By which Elphaz means that Job is well aware that suffering occurs in human life. He goes on to say, but now that you, Job, are in misery, you're impatient for it to get over with. He's almost saying, you've helped others get through rough times, and so you know that you too can get through them. He continues by telling Job that, yes, this is an awful time, but that Job will get through it, that God is good, dependable, life-giving, even if at times God reproves and disciplines, even if God sometimes wounds, God also binds up and heals and, and delivers. God is trustworthy and brings things round once again. God is in the business of reversing the fortunes, the bad fortunes of the faithful who turn to God for help. In what feels incredibly tone deaf to me, Elphaz ends his answer to Job by speaking about the coming reversal of fortunes that Job can count on, ones that will restore flocks and real estate and even family. Job 5, 24 through 27 says, you shall know that your tent is safe and you shall inspect your fold and miss nothing. You shall know that your descendants will be many and your offspring like the grass of the earth. You shall come to your grave in ripe old age as a shock of grain comes to the threshing floor in its season. See, we have searched this out. It is true. Hear and know it for yourself. Can you imagine speaking these words to a person who has lost livestock and children and is begging for only one thing, and that is death? His friend says, you'll have more kids, more flocks, and you will live for a long, long time. Carol Newsom, in her extraordinary book, The Book of Job, A Contest of Moral Imaginations, says that Elphaz is helping Job to believe that his narrative, his story, has not come to an end. Human beings are storytellers. We depend upon them to make sense of the world and to encourage us when our own stories seem to have lost the thread. Job is currently telling himself a narrative about his life that says that the only good thing that could happen to him now would be for him to die. Job is begging God to bring him to the peaceful non-existence of death. Elphaz tells Job, this, Job, this is not the end that God, even if God is punishing Job now, is able to make things better. Although Elphaz's intentions are good, they are ill-timed and disrespectful of what Job has lost and what he is feeling at the time. It's like the person who says, how old was your mother when she died? Oh, that's not such a loss. She lived a good long life. Or it's like the person who says, you can have other children to the couple who are devastated by their recent miscarriage. It's like the person who says, things always work out for you. You'll get another job, find another house to buy, another person to love. These things may in fact be true, but the old job, the not completed sale of the house, the divorced spouse, the lost child, the deceased parent, will never be replaced, never not missed, never not matter. Elphaz wants Job to get on with his life far too soon with little regard for what he has lost and little knowledge that what Job has lost will remain with him and change him for the rest of his life. 
When my son was attending college in Florida, he served on a water-based search and rescue team that, in addition to helping inexperienced local and tourist sailors, or students who'd run out of gas with a boat they'd checked out of the boat library that his college had, also provided rescue and recovery in the vicinity of a nearby bridge, which boasted the fourth most likely place for people to attempt suicide in the entire nation. He and his classmates sometimes retrieved bodies and sometimes picked up survivors. Always it was grueling and difficult work. They had wonderful support in place. They had chaplains and psychologists and the kids talked and were coached about how to understand what they'd experienced. Nevertheless, it was taxing and hard for them. One time my son Caleb texted me saying that he needed to talk, was I free? Now, although we were in regular contact, it was usually through texting and email. And so I knew that if he wanted to talk, he was struggling. I called immediately. What's up? I asked. I didn't go on this rescue mission, he said, Mom, but my team date mates did, and they are a wreck. I know that you deal with death in your work, and I need to know how to support them through dealing with the awful case that they experience today. Now, I won't traumatize you with the specifics of what happened that was far and above what they usually encountered, but it was horrific. I said to him that when I am faced with a tragedy, I have an order in how I proceed in the midst of these situations. I try to remember to simply be present in the beginning, to speak as little as possible, unless the person is asking lots of questions, and then I try to only address what they are bringing up. I am there simply to accompany them, to put my arm around their shoulders, to get a cold glass of water, to have tissues, and to let them get out whatever it is they may need to share, or to be silent, if that is what is most comforting to them. Much like Job's friends who sat in silence and kept him company without needing him to get on with it or to pull himself up by his bootstraps, silence is often the best way to be with someone in the beginning of a tragedy. As time goes on, sometimes days, sometimes weeks, I might begin to ask questions or make suggestions gentle ones meant to remind them to eat or sleep or rest or even recreate. Even if I am thinking for my own reassurance in the midst of the pain that they will get through what they are experiencing, I never bring up the future until they do themselves. And that's where Job's first friend falters. He was so uncomfortable with Job's pain Rather than waiting for Job to get on board with re-envisioning his own story when he was good and ready, Elphaz needed Job to see a way to a good future right away because Elphaz couldn't stand the pain that Job was experiencing at that moment. It reminded me when I was going through infertility, I just wanted someone to say, I'm sorry. But instead, they often said, begin the adoption process and you'll get pregnant, or do this or do that. I just needed them to let me be sad. It is very hard to let people be sad. And yet, there is something so incredibly important about that. Right now, many of us are struggling. There is rampant illness throughout our nation our educational and vocational and relationship plans are stalled or uncertain or unsafe. Our nation is only also finally addressing our unjust and racist societal patterns and behaviors. We're approaching an unprecedentedly volatile and chaotic election season in which no matter the outcome, significant portions of the country will feel cheated, unheard, and angry. If ever our personal and national and global narrative were disrupted, it is now. 
And just like with Elphaz, who wanted Job to walk back into his happy story, it is tempting to try to say, everything's going to be okay. It's even tempting to try to act as if everything already is okay. But this is where, like Job's friend did, we could seriously misstep in how to move forward. Things are a mess in many ways, which is not to say things aren't wonderful in other places, but we are dealing with significant troubles these days. There is much work to do, but we must go slowly. We must grieve and evaluate and examine how we got where we are now, environmentally, societally, politically, racially, economically. They are so intertwined, and it's important to understand how to make all aspects of our lives and our society and our world healthy, so that when we rebuild and resume, we can do so in a way that other tragedies won't befall so readily or easily. There will be no athletics at Ivy League colleges this fall. It was a hard call to make, but it was the right one to make so that we can begin to stop the spread of this virus. There may be staggered or hybrid or continued remote learning taking place in schools all over the country, which is devastating to young kids who want to be together playing on playgrounds and for families who need to get back to work. But this hybrids or remote learning or slowing and changing and staggering how kids come back to school will be necessary if we are to keep students and families and teachers and administrators safe. There are so many things that are not as we would like them to be. But nevertheless, they are as they must be if we are to proceed at a pace that will keep people safe. Some are tired of hearing about racism and the need for change, but we are only now beginning the long and overdue necessary national conversation about race and privilege on a grand scale where many people are involved. May we have the willingness to do this important and ultimately life-giving work as long as it takes. It takes great courage to live into disruption and discomfort. But it is foolhardy to move too quickly. May we not do what Job's friend did and say, get on with it. See the story as successful. Move into your accomplishments. Be happy. May we take the time to emerge from the lockdown safely to enter into conversations about race and privilege honestly and patiently, to do what needs to be done that our world can be kept safe and not polluted to death. May we all find blessings and grace to go at the right pace as we open ourselves both to the grief we're experiencing and the healing that can come our way. May we prepare to move forward with wisdom when the time is right. God bless you all as you move forward with God's grace. Amen.
We are so fortunate to be able to come into God's presence to share who we are and how we are and to ask God to help us move forward. Let us gather together in prayer. The Lord be with you. And also also with you. you. Let us pray. Merciful God, we are in troubled times. The nation is rife with illness. People are struggling economically. Our political conversation is ratcheting up as we approach a national election. We have many different opinions about how best to solve and address all of these issues. Give us patience, God, to think things through. Give us clarity about how to include the most members of our community, whatever that might be, in whatever task lays ahead, so that the outcome will respect and represent the diversity of who we are. Even in the midst of such hard and difficult days, O God, we praise you that there are wonderful things happening. Summer joy and beauty, times to appreciate the achievements of others, friendships that are strengthened through the longer daylight and times to think about the glory of your creation. So we thank you, God, for a world full of pain and beauty. Throughout it all, we walk with one another when we struggle. And we ask now, O oh God, that you be with Sarera Longmore as she continues to fight with the help of the wonderful team at DHMC after her horrific car accident. Please give strength to her twin sister who has not left her side and her family as they wait patiently for her to come out of her coma and rejoin them in this world. Please grant her the courage to attack her recovery with the fighting spirit for which she is known. Dear God, she is one of your precious children with so much to offer this world in her long life yet to live. We thank you for her health and recovery. We pray that you support all those who are upholding her. Thank you, God, for bringing us together in concern about Sierra. We bring before you all the people whose names we don't know who are wrestling with long and debilitating recoveries, family members who are eagerly waiting to see the spark of their loved one revived. We ask, O God, that you be present in our nation as those who are contracting the coronavirus multiply in extraordinary ways. Help us, God, to get a handle on this and to diminish the illness that surrounds us. And be with those who are struggling with other health concerns. Help them to know your peace, to feel your presence, and to experience your healing touch. God, we open our lives to you, asking that you guide and direct us that we might be fully your people, blessing your creation wholly and walking together, walking with your son Christ who taught us to pray saying, our Father Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy thy name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, come, thy thy will be done done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give Give us this this day day our daily bread bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. One of my favorite lines from scripture is when God is purported to have said, Behold, I do a new thing. Do you see it spring forth? I love that idea of God doing things differently than they have been done before. None of us could have anticipated that we would be doing worship virtually, not just for weeks, but for months. And we will continue to worship virtually for quite some time. You have continued to stay engaged, connected, supportive, 
generous, and we are dependent upon that. We thank you for the ways in which you have kept up with your pledges and offering, and for those of you who are not already members of our congregation, but who have sent in financial support. I can tell you that we're using it faithfully to do the work of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, caring for the hungry and those who are struggling, and taking good care of God's earth. So thank you for supporting this ministry. Please continue to do so, so that we can continue to share the good news of God's love. Let us pray in gratitude for the opportunity to support this work. Holy God, we thank you for blessing us with resources that are useful to you as your work and mission and love is spread throughout the ends of the globe. Thank you, God, for faithful people who feel connected to the work that is done through this congregation and who believe that they best serve the needs of the larger community by putting them into our hands. May we be faithful stewards, God, of all that you have given us. May we use it to make your world a better place, to care for humanity, and to bless creation in all that we are, with all that we have. For your goodness, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In good times and in bad, we are lifted and guided by the words of our covenant, which we will share now. Let us covenant and recovenant with God and with one another. Loving, Loving God, God, you call, you call us, us and we, we do, do covenant, covenant with, with you, you and, and with, with one, one another to walk, walk together, together in all your ways as you, as you reveal, reveal yourself to us. us. To, to give ourselves, ourselves freely and with, with open hearts to the, the ministry of our church, to become more faithful to the life and teachings of Jesus Christ, to celebrate your gifts of unity and diversity, to restore and protect all your creation, to take up your mission around the world, striving for justice and peace, to care for all people, reconcile ourselves to them in love. We give thanks for your gift of grace in every human life. I love the first time I raised my hands in a church service and blessed people with words full of love and power 
that supported God's presence in our lives and called us forth to live into God's blessing. Today, I take my hands and point them to these flowers grown in the garden of one of our members as a blessing. They remind us that God blesses or gives a benediction in all days, in all ways, especially in the summer with the beauty of the earth. May you look around you and know that you are blessed. Thank mm-hmm. you.